Okay. Wow. Beautiful place. Thank you very much for coming. It's, uh, it's not obvious to be able to, to meet people. Uh, I've been fed up a little bit with Zoom and Webex, I must say. So, very happy to be here live with all of you in this great place. Thank you, President, for uh, hosting us and inviting me and hosting me and uh, Federico Bianchi, my colleague. We come all the way down from London. And it's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I thought, I thought that maybe the best thing is to start a little bit personal. I'm sure the President will bring us to more uh, professional uh, territories and political ones, so let, uh, uh, let me maybe start by saying that my political awakening goes back to my age of 11. Uh, and we are, uh, you know, bear with me, we are in 1968. Seems a long time ago for you. For me, this was the time of May 68 in Paris and the Prague Spring in Prague than the capital of Czechoslovakia, behind the Iron Curtain. And I was in Portugal, behind the dictatorship that only fell in 1974. So here I am, eight, uh, 11 years old, uh, watching TV, and uh, I think I trace back this as being my first encounter with politics, my first, my political awakening I would call it that way. Then came in 1974 the Portuguese Revolution. We put an end to 48 years of dictatorship. And, uh, and I was uh, 17 years old. So you can imagine what the revolution does to a 17 years old, right? Or what a 17 years old can do with a revolution. And, uh, and this was my uh, really sort of second political awakening, if you want it that way. And uh, I immediately said, I want to be part of this, I want to... Uh, so, in fact, I decided not to start the university immediately, but to go to the professional world. And I did all my studies while working as a journalist. For seven years, I did maybe, you know, my real profession, or certainly my second profession. Uh, anyway, a a wonderful job in the middle of a, a very intense moment in the history of my country. I was destined to law, to be a lawyer. I think there was an uncle that had reserved a seat in his office for me. But of course, like any 17, 18, 19 years old, I didn't want to follow, in the middle of revolution, I didn't want to follow a conservative path, no links with any part in this country, uh, and chose uh, rather to cross the avenue in the Portuguese uh, university campus and do history. Maybe some of you are made that choice as well here. And I did all my studies in university while working as a journalist. Things that you can do when you are 18, 19, 20. That is, leaving the newspaper around 1.30 in the morning and starting school at 8.30 in the same morning. Um, I wouldn't be able to do that today, of course, but those times were so rich, so intense, you had so much to learn about, you had so much to experience. Remember, young guy in a young democracy, uh, great times. And that's where I built, of course, my professional capabilities, but also my better understanding of the world. And I worked seven years as a journalist, and at the age of 25, uh, they offered the triple of my salary, and I joined the European Union. That's not the only reason, though. But it's an important factor. I think the main reason was that for us in Portugal, coming out of a dictatorship, joining the European Union, or contributing to that, because Portugal only joined in 1986, I joined the ranks of uh, the European diplomacy in 1982, for us, joining Europe was consolidating democracy, was a way to modernize the country, to be part of our natural environment, which was and still is today 
uh, Europe, the European Union, that time European communities. This is, was a natural evolution. And, port, and the membership of the European Union brought, uh, transformed Portugal from a backward, very conservative, rural country to, uh, you know, some of you may have been to Portugal, to Lisbon. There's nothing compared with what it was in the times of my youth. And this is something that we, to a large extent, owe to European membership. In the meantime, and since then, I've, I've traveled around. I think I visited about 75 countries in the world. I lived in the Azores, I lived in Lisbon, I lived in Porto, I lived in Brussels, Washington, New York, and now London. And this, I guess, that includes, by the way, the 50 states of the United States, which I visited while as an ambassador. And I think this is very important, and this is one of the messages I wanted to uh, bring over to you. Um, I think one of the problems we have in our societies today, in some of our countries, is that people are, their view of the world is a bit too narrow. I think it's very important to widen the scope and the lens in order to understand things better. It's very difficult to understand what happens in Oxford without considering the wider context, the country, the continent, uh, and the world. And this is something that I bring to, whenever I have the privilege of talking to people younger than me, is to try to share that experience. Go out, reach out, open your eyes and ears, absorb as much as you can. Which links me to the, leads me to the, the relationship between journalism and diplomacy. I've done both, and I found a, a number of common elements in, in, in them. Uh, the first one is curiosity, which I think, I'm sure, you share as well, being, being here. Curiosity. If you don't like to know things, or if you don't aspire to know more, don't go to journalism. Uh, don't go to diplomacy either. It's about trying to understand better, discover, you go, go a little bit deeper, sometimes go behind the curtain, go to the backstage, with licit means, of course. And, uh, and try to, while doing that, uh, understand the essence of things. And then process all that information, be selective, you know, choose what should be the headline or should be the theme of your message to your minister back home, but also being able to engage, convince, communicate. If you're a journalist and you don't convince the reader that what you're writing is valuable, it's close to the truth and it's useful, no point in being a journalist. If you are a diplomat and you cannot, uh, you know, engage with the your partners, the one you're negotiating with, the one, the country that hosts you, whoever, interlocutor, if you are not able to also convince. And last but not least, you need to be able to communicate. You know, uh, no point in being a journalist or diplomat if one cannot really communicate. So it's, it's very interesting to see how different professions come together in the in the sense that they need to use a number of abilities and one needs to develop a number of qualities as well. A word about Europe in all this. What is my feeling today after working for the European Union for 38 years and after also my experience, my life experience around the world? I think, you know, but you, you can contradict me and that's what we're here for. Huh? But I think this is one of the most uh, successful projects in, uh, in recent history. But the only way for us to really assess how much we have all together, including British people, contributed to, to build, is to look where we were a couple of decades ago, at the middle of last century, and how much Europe contributed to suffering. Europe, by Europe, I mean European countries 
by having two civil wars that became world wars, how much uh, we have, our previous generations, unfortunately contributed to suffering. But also how much the following generations, which I enormously respect, the ones that came after the Second World War, how much they were able to change things. You know, for my children, for my very small grandchildren, uh, you know, imagine a war between France and Germany. It doesn't make a lot of sense. They have trouble living with Brexit, by the way. But that's another story that I'm sure we'll have questions about it. But the, the fact that we have peace in Europe, the fact that countries talk to each other, the fact that people can travel around, that can establish themselves in different countries, that they can you know, find love in a different country, and this not being too complicated. Uh, you know, that business can benefit from the scale of the internal market, the biggest internal market in the world. All that should not be taken for granted. And I think one of the lessons of Brexit is exactly that one. Nothing should be taken for granted. And we should cherish what we have accomplished, in this case, in the, the European Union. And some people say, well, okay, but now with Brexit, okay, we regret Brexit, but we respect Brexit. So we have to move on. And the European Union is moving on. And in a way that maybe some did not expect. I was in the, in the US uh, representing the Union at the United Nations in, 19, in 2016, when the the referendum took place. And I can tell you the following morning, people, you know, less friendly with Europe, the more cynical ones about Europe were saying, Ambassador, so what, what is the next country to leave? When are you going to lose your job? So how long would the, the EU survive? Uh, it was a major blow for the project, of course, the first country that decides to leave. It's not a, not a, a joyful day. It was actually a sad day for us. Imagine I've been working almost 40 years for this project and suddenly a country, a major partner of ours decides to leave. It was a major blow. It was a sad morning, I can tell you. Particularly before I went, because I went to bed believing that they would stay, which was, you know, all the polls were saying that. And of course, the following morning, we had this bad news. But people were saying basically, well, this is the, the end of the Union, this will go down uh, certainly gradually, but sustainably so. Well, that's not the case. And I think, uh, and I'm very proud of our member states, of the European institutions, the way they have uh, turned around things to a large extent. Because if you look at the recent decisions taken in the post-COVID uh, situation, in July, European Council uh, making uh, extremely important decisions about the future of the European Union. Our reaction to the, the sanitary crisis, our reaction to the economic crisis, uh, that is there and maybe will be there for, with us for some time, it's a major breakthrough. It's a major qualitative change in the way Europe operates. If you look at the opinion polls in Europe today, there is higher support for Europe than, than before Brexit. So I am at the same time very proud of what we have achieved so far, particularly proud of how we reacted to uh, Brexit, COVID, this economic crisis. Happy as well because I see that our system, our democratic system of shared sovereignty between or among the 27 is an intelligent system. It can learn from mistakes, it can learn from crises, it can rebound, and it can re-energize and renovate itself. And this is the history of the European Union, if we go back to, to the 50s. Step by step, incremental, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but always in the sense of an ever closer union, as we like to say. I'll stop here with just one final thought. 
which is uh, about the world, or us in the world. I've had, uh, I visited a number of countries, as I told you, but my most obvious uh, empirical evidence of the importance of the European Union in today's world has been, have been my four years at, as ambassador to the United Nations recently. I left in November last year. And this uh, confirmed to me something that I, you know, thought I knew, but now I, I fully confirmed, <coughs> that the world, needs, the world needs something like the European Union. That today's world, where multilateral systems are being challenged, where the rule of law is being challenged, where, where a number of principles that we thought were guaranteed, you remember the end of history and all that? Uh, they are not guaranteed. They should not be taken for granted. And if there is one actor that can contribute to sustain a liberal order, to uh, protect and preserve human rights, the rule of law, democracy, freedom, open markets, that actor is the European Union. And uh, so today, I'm ambassador in a country that decided to leave. I started my career in an embassy of a country that desperately wanted to join. So it's a bit of a, of a circle. But uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that not only Europe is following its course with renewed enthusiasm, although we have our problems, of course, but also, that's my very final point, and that's the purpose of me being in London today, I, I'm hopeful that in spite of Brexit, we can make good out of the future relationship between the EU and the United Kingdom. There's a lot of us to do to benefit our citizens, our business, a lot of good things we can do to the world, and I do hope that uh, the outcome of these negotiations and the people are negotiating as we speak, uh, and very intensely, uh, that the outcome will be first a deal and not a no deal, secondly an ambitious deal that will provide the, the foundations for a solid forward-looking relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. That's my hope and that's my belief, but I'm sure you'll have a number of questions that we try to challenge my assertions. Uh, and, uh, and that's the good thing of being at the, the Oxford Union, is that we're here to debate in a democratic way, in an open way, and I wish you all the best and thank you for coming uh, today. Thank you very, very much. So, to start off, you obviously took on your role this year as the EU's first ambassador to the UK, as the UK is finding its new position outside of the EU and with this third country status. So, obviously, you're in an absolutely unique position for an ambassador. So, to start off as a very broad question, how do you see the aims of your role? Well, as I just said, the, the most sort of noble and long-term role is to I modestly contribute together with my team to launching the foundations of this future relationship. And uh, in order to get there, our most immediate objective and goal is to agree with the UK the terms of that relationship. And, uh, and again, I hope these terms will be ambitious and far-reaching. The second one is that we have to finish our homework. The homework we started with what we call the withdrawal agreement which is basically, basically sets the terms of our divorce. And uh, that's not yet done. And there are a number of areas which are critical, particularly the situation in Northern Ireland and uh, the rights of our citizens, EU citizens in the UK. I'm sure there's some of them here. And uh, UK citizens in our 27 uh, member states. So these are, you know, more long term and more short term. I would add to that that we would like to contribute, together with all my colleagues, ambassadors of the 27 member states of the European Union and their teams, to um, you know, developing links with 
the British society at large, from business to academia to media, and, uh, and we are very much committed to, uh, to doing so. Thank you. And since you mentioned the deal, let's discuss that now rather than waiting. Um, do you think that at this point in negotiations there is a realistic chance of the UK doing anything but having a no-deal Brexit? No, I think there's definitely a chance uh, for both of us to create conditions for a deal. Uh, and I see the rationale of it. Uh, uh, and again, going back to my initial comments, to understand this we need to enlarge the scope of our, of our lens. And look at the world today. Look at the world today. Uh, the multilateral system, the rules-based order that we built after the Second World War, that we consolidated after the end of the Cold War, that we further consolidated with uh, the opening up of a number of countries, including China, this order is now being challenged, seriously challenged. And uh, we cannot afford not to join efforts, in this case between the EU and the UK, to continue that fight. Because that's about our values, as much as it is about our interests. The values we stand for, the interests of our countries, of our families, of our businesses. But also the world is facing new threats. Climate change, of course, major one that requires international cooperation. Terrorism, coming from non-state actors, coming with sometimes don't know exactly from where, that again requires international uh, cooperation. The new threats like cyber or biochemical, all that requires international cooperation, but not any kind of international cooperation. International cooperation based on the principles we cherish. Again, democratic principles, the rule of law, all that. In today's world, with the volatility that we have, it makes a lot of sense for countries that basically share the same values and the same strategic interests to join efforts. I think it's relatively obvious, and when something is obvious, when something makes sense, I think there's a higher degree of chance that it will happen. And that's my maybe naive belief that it makes a lot of sense for us to find a deal. If I go more technically, I would say that if I look at the files, and I cannot go in detail now, but if I look at the files with my experience of other difficult negotiations, I like to say, if there is a will, there will be a deal. It is possible, it is doable, and it is desirable. And uh, you know, that's why I believe we will have a deal. Now, if you want me to bet, I'm not a gambler, I won't bet, uh, but uh, I have the, uh, a rational uh, understanding of the con that the conditions are met for that to, to happen, but again, Politics and diplomacy, it's never guaranteed. The outcome is never guaranteed. But we, what I can guarantee you and all the friends here, the European Union is absolutely committed, engaged and determined to find a good deal with the United Kingdom. But if ever there is no possibility of that, we are prepared for a no deal. We think it's a bad idea on top of a bad idea, uh, but we will be ready. Uh, but I hope we won't get there. Especially in light of the passage of the Internal Market Bill, do you think that the UK government is acting in bad faith? Well, let's put it this way. When you sign a deal and less than a year later you question the elements of that deal, it is understandable that the other side asks the question whether there is good faith in that behavior. And, uh, and that's what we did. We, we were surprised. Uh, we, we expressed that surprise. We asked for correction of that surprise. That correction did not come. And we activated the mechanisms foreseen in the withdrawal agreement to challenge the position 
that the British government took. And we started a legal procedure and we are waiting now for the reaction from the British government. I suppose that speaks to a broader question about how in your role you go about negotiating a strong diplomatic relationship to face all of these challenges that you believe uh, multilateralism is required for when the objective is distancing in the first case. Yeah, but uh, I mean, we, again, we accept and respect the decision taken to leave the European Union. Nobody in my team, no ambassador, no politician in Europe is asking you to change your mind or the British people to change its mind or the government to change its position. That's not the issue. The issue is you've left. We agreed on the terms of the separation. The terms of the separation needs to, need to be implemented in respect for the agreement. That's one side. And the other one is to say you left, but life, there's life after Brexit. Right? Life doesn't stop on the 1st of January 21st. How are we going to organize ourselves in afterwards? You know, like in a divorce, I mean, how are we going to take care of the children? You know, uh, how, we, you know how do we organize this? That's important uh, because there's life after Brexit. Uh, and our business will continue their lives, our citizens will continue their lives, and we need to organize that relationship in the best possible way. And this is what we're doing right now. This is about organizing our common life after the 1st of January, having in mind the context in which it happens, having in mind the history of our relationship. Of course, it's different uh, when we talk with Britain than we talk with uh, Japan or Korea. And I love Japan and Korea, by the way, uh, part of the countries I visited. But it's different from the UK. Uh, our historic links, our economic links, our people-to-people -people links. And this is again a good demonstration here in Oxford, the, the number of European Union uh, students here. Um, so, let's focus on the future. Let's, let's, let's build something uh, with full respect for the decision that is taken. No one is asking the UK to come back, we're just asking or working together to find the best, best possible relationship for the future. Focusing on the future then, in practical terms, what does a strong EU-UK post-Brexit relationship looks like, look like, excuse me, that can face up to the kinds of challenges you've described in your speech? Well, we, we back in uh, March, April, we put on the table, we, the European Union, put on the table a full text of a draft uh, agreement that corresponds to my vision, our vision, of an ambitious, far-reaching, wide and, and deep uh, relationship, which is anchored on a, on a solid economic partnership, meaning a free trade area, zero tariffs, zero quotas, a, a, an agreement on fisheries, and a number of other elements of cooperation in different areas of economic activities, from transports to you name it, energy, nuclear. That's the economic one. And on top of that, we said there should also be a partnership on security, foreign policy and security matters, as a complement to the economic uh, relationship. So these are two major elements of this relationship. Uh, the, the, the underlying approach is to say, uh, let's, in fact, limit the damage of Brexit. Let's agree and accept that you have left, but let's see how much we can do to keep our economies very close together to the benefit of the business and the citizens on both sides of the channel. That's what we're talking about right now. We propose to the UK the most ambitious deal ever. We never proposed any other partner, anything as ambitious, as deep, as wide, as the one we proposed, the United Kingdom. And, uh, but of course, when we propose such a, an ambitious deal, it has to come with a number of conditions. And the major one, which I would like you to understand, is that we need to 
protect and preserve one of our biggest achievements, as I referred earlier, which is our internal market. In almost half a billion people, the biggest internal market in the world, the second economy in the world, which has achieved you know, this reality of freedom of circulation, of people, services, capitals, and goods. We are not going to challenge, put this in question, endanger what is our jewel in the crown, the internal market. So we need to find with UK uh, the best way to, on one side, to allow them to have uh, this privileged access to our internal market, but guaranteeing on our side that the interests of our internal market are not jeopardized, are not really put in question. And this is, of course, that's why they pay diplomats, is to find, uh, you know, square the circle, right? <laughs> and uh, I hope we can make it in the, in, the coming, in the coming days. Say the UK does say no. What's next for the relationship then? Well, the no-deal scenario is one that will bring us to international rules, uh, as far as trade is concerned, World Trade Organization rules, mm -hmm. which will imply tariffs and quotas. On top of something that we cannot avoid because the UK decided, and this was not absolutely necessary, you can leave the European Union and still be part of the single market and the customs union. And that was at one point the position of the British government, as you may remember. This position has evolved towards a decision to leave the single market and the customs union, which means that in any case, with a deal or without a deal, there will be checks and, uh, checks and controls at the borders. So you already have a certain amount of additional burden for our economic operators as a result of Brexit and the result of the decision to leave the single market and the customs union. If we have a deal, that will be about it. We will not be adding anything in terms of burden and, and complication for... But if we have a no deal, then you have to this level of burden, you will have to add another layer of tariffs, quotas and, and difficulties for for trade and for movement uh, across our borders. And uh, that's what we want to avoid. That's what, and of course it will create, I mean, if you have a deal, the atmosphere is conducive to continue to work, even deepen in some areas, maybe open other areas that were not covered by, by the deal. If you have a no deal, if, that is if you separate in bad terms, uh, the appetite to sort of, you know, start talking the, 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 the day after is not, is not huge. Mm -hmm. On both sides, I would say. So, no deal would also create a sort of climate which is not very favorable to uh, pursuing the deepening of our relationship. I, I hope we won't get there. Again, I think there are conditions to avoid that. But, you know, we're talking about politics, we're talking about uh, difficult issues. So, our job is to collectively, the negotiators on both sides, the ambassadors, the politicians, of course, is to make sure that we avoid uh, accidents, that we avoid the cliff, and that we can, uh, in the meantime, get, get to, to, to a good deal. I hope we can. Moving on from the specifics of the future relationship then, I want to talk more broadly about what you mentioned regarding the sort of multilateral rules-based order and the role of the EU um, on the international stage mm. today. When you have China on one side, the US on the other, really challenging this, the kind of end of history theories that you discussed earlier about how the world works, how global cooperation works, what is the role of the EU today and how does it go about defending all of these things that it stands for when you have these great challenges coming from great, what are essentially superpowers? Yeah, um, there's a new reality in the, in, the, in, the, in the world scene, as we have noticed, which is this 
new um, tension, I would call it this way for the moment, uh, between the, the United States and China. Um, I mean, you can say that this was about to happen, right? Uh, in the sense that China has grown in the last 20 years or so, particularly since they joined the, the World Trade Organization and they, they sort of intensified their openness to the world, uh, became, of course, a more important actor than before. And, uh, you know, there are a number of good books about, about, about confrontation between big powers. And uh, there's a good one from Graham Allison, which I, from Harvard, which I, I recommend. Uh, so this is historically known, and the, and the dynamics are, have been studied. But that's a fact right now. So the, how, what kind of, of, of shape this will take in the near future, uh, I think will depend on a number of factors. One is, of course, uh, an important election about to take place across the Atlantic, but not only. So how do we position ourselves, you were asking, in this, in this uh, situation? First of all, I don't think we encourage people from, uh, or to uh, what uh, the new concept uh, of decoupling. Mm -hmm. We are not in favor of decoupling. Uh, I, we think decoupling will be a bad thing. And by decoupling, I mean there will be two systems working in parallel. Uh, and uh, I don't think this is good. We don't think this is good for the world. Uh, globalization has brought enormous benefits for mankind. It needs to be adapted. It needs to be sort of corrected in its uh, worst effects. Uh, and we can talk about that. Uh, but it's basically uh, a a good way of governing the world. You know, multilateral institutions, uh, rules-based uh, order that everybody respects, and uh, allowing millions of people to come out of poverty. That's what we did in the last few years. We need to adapt this system, renovate it, reform it, both the multilateral system and the economic globalization apparatus. The best way to do that is if we all work together, not by separating two halves of the world or, or going back to the, uh, the idea of uh, zones of influence and, uh, and all that. So we are, uh, I think, we will be, and we are already today, a force in trying to prevent that from happening and creating conditions for more consensual solutions for the problems that we have. I don't think we would like to be in a position where we have to choose between the US and China. That's not our program. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, in certain areas, let's be very frank, and I'm speaking the personal capacity here right now on this topic, I have no choice that my choice is the United States. Uh, but I think our purpose now is to prevent that kind of choice to be, to be put upon us. And, and, and the way I see the role of the EU in this context, that's what I try to do in New York, is for us to be a force of, of good, a force, a, a, a force in, the, in the global scene that, that uh, tries to preserve and protect and promote human rights, rule of law, you know, what we call the, the liberal order. Mm. Uh, because we believe that, although not perfect, it is proven to be the best way to organize the world. And that's what we want to do. And we have the way to do that, you know. Even at 27, mm. as I was saying, we are the second biggest economy in the world, the, the, the most important internal market. We are the biggest contributors to the United Nations system financially. We are the most important provider of humanitarian aid, development aid in the world. We are the first source of foreign direct investment in the world. And uh, so we are a force and a force for good. And that's, that's what I think we can contribute to today's world. Right. Then final very broad question from me before I'm sure the audience will have very specific ones. Um, in that case, is the future of a strong 
I was going to say strong and stable, a strong EU27 um, facing these great global challenges. Does that only work with greater political, um, economic, etc., security integration, or are we at a good balance now? Yeah, that's a very good question for this. There is no answer. Only time would tell. Uh, you know, if I go back to our history, uh, as I was briefly referring in the beginning, mm -hmm. if we look back into the history of the European Union, you see exactly that. Yeah. It has been a process of gradual, incremental strengthening of our integration, sharing more and more parts of our sovereignty, national sovereignty, for the common good. Mm -hmm. This has been our, our process. Uh, you know, if you go back to 1957, which is the year I was born, so I was born in the Treaty of Rome for some, for some reason. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the Treaty of Rome, it has the, the seeds for what we are today. But the European Union and the community at the time that you saw in the Treaty of Rome has very little to do with where we are today. The seeds were there, but not, yeah. not the flowers uh, of this plant. And, and uh, you know, there was no single currency, there was no real internal market at all. Uh, there were no common policies like the ones we have, including uh, common foreign and security policy. Uh, and if you look back, you've seen incremental development and deepening in all areas of our cooperation. So the natural trend of the European Union is to strengthen its capacity through uh, increased integration. The question that we could ask is that how would that development operate in the future? You know, would all countries follow the same rhythm, uh, align themselves fully into the different areas of cooperation or not? But if you look today, it's already not the case anymore. You have countries in the Euro and countries outside of the Euro. You have countries in the Schengen area and countries outside of the Schengen area. Uh, and countries uh, with different degrees of participation in areas like justice and home affairs uh, and beyond. So, a certain element of, of diversity is already included in our system. The question is, will this diversity increase in the future? Will it decrease? Uh, what kind of way will we go in the future? Uh, the beauty of our system, it's no one can predict it, because it's built every day, every year, after each crisis and after each uh, development, including, you know, after Brexit. Brexit has an impact also on, 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 the, on how the EU will operate in the future. Great, thank you very much. With that, we'll move to audience questions. Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak and the mic will be brought to you and held by a member of committee. Please keep your mask on while you ask your question for the sanitation of the mic. Does anybody have any questions? On the front row first. Uh, hi, so what do you think the European Union can do about democratic backsliding in countries like, say, Hungary and Poland? I think I, I got your question about Hungary and Poland. And Listen, the, the, the EU is a community of law. Law is our most important foundation. We are united by law. Uh, and ultimately, it is the European Court of Justice that determines the way we operate on the basis of the treaties and all the different acquis communautaires, as we call it. So that is valid also for the issue of democracy and rule of law. Uh, and that's what we are doing. Whenever we identify in one of our member states situations that are not aligned and in full respect of the primacy of law, regardless of the area where this may happen, our obligation is to, is to initiate, is to intervene, is to, uh, beginning by questioning the member states about different measures taken and, and following the, the normal procedures. 
I must say that in recent times there have been reasons for uh, the EU attention and action in these fields that maybe were not that before. So that means that we also need to adapt to a new intensity of these situations. And that's again what we are doing right now. Just a couple of weeks ago, we produced the first ever rule of law report in which we look at the, the commission, I mean, the European Commission looks at the situation in each country, identifying uh, potential areas of non-respect for those fundamental principles. And in doing so, we sort of activate the member states to, to respond and to ultimately to act in correction of that. So there are different mechanisms in the treaty that allow that to happen. That is a democratic accountability through the European Parliament as well has been very attentive to, to these issues. So this is something that we take seriously, that we want to do in full respect to our procedures and our rules and the rights of those countries to, to contradict and to react and to explain. But ultimately, uh, this will require, and as you've seen very recently, a, a decision by the European Court of Justice regarding one of the countries that you mentioned, uh, and that is absolutely uh, implementable. And we will have to guarantee that those uh, decisions are fully accountable. Fantastic. Um, any more questions? Just right in the middle in the front row. Hi, if I may, I would like to ask two questions. The first one is about outward communication of the EU. Every, if I always, when I talk um, with either Euro, Europe skeptics or also Brexit proponents, it seems to be that the national media does a good job in highlighting the drawbacks of the union, while there's not a lot of a communication coming of the efforts of the achievements of the institution or Europe as a whole. So I was wondering, why is Europe or the European Union as an institution struggling to communi communicate their benefits to the general public, especially with lower socioeconomic backgrounds? And the second one, second question would be about the expansion of the European Union seems after Brexit. Um, there are a lot of open questions about strate strategic alignment of the, of the Union and also of the, about the future, but there still seems to be ongoing talks about the expansion to the Balkans, Romania, yeah. Turkey, Ukraine. Is it sensible to keep expanding and construct that has still is tr still trying to be stable in their current state? Thank you. Two very different questions. I'll try. I hope I understood them because the sound is not, is not perfect. Or at least my hearing capabilities are not perfect. Uh, but I think the first one is about how to communicate and the role of national press as opposed to a sort of European vision of things. Um, well, I think the starting point there is that we are 27 countries, 24 or 25 official languages right now. Uh, it's, it's questionable whether there is a, a European demos, if the, whether there is a, a sort of a, a European-wide uh, debate uh, territory, if you want to call it that way. Because, in fact, uh, to a large extent, uh, in spite of all the developments I mentioned and the importance that the European Union has in everyday lives, of all of us and our business and our families, in fact, the debate, the public debate, the political debate, is to a large extent at the national level. It's done in, in our mother tongue, it's done within our newspapers and television stations, it's done in our parliaments. Uh, the European Parliament plays a very important role and an increasingly important role, but the reality is that the debate takes to a large extent place in a national, at the national level. Which of course makes it more complicated for people to have a, a vision of the EU as, as a whole. It's making it more complicated to distinguish between sort of a national version of decisions taken in Brussels and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a more complete picture. And, uh, you know, uh, 
former president of the European Commission, for whom I was the, the chief of staff, uh, José Manuel Barroso, once said, uh, if member states blame Brussels for every wrong thing that happens from Monday to Friday, how can you expect people to vote for Europe on Sunday? And this is a real question, which I think uh, you know, leads us to the responsibility of, of national governments about promoting the concept of Europe and the project of Europe. And sometimes people say, why doesn't Brussels communicate better? I mean, do people accept uh, that communication comes from Brussels? You know, a guy in a suit like this with a, a terrible accent speak, uh, trying to convince me that Europe is a good thing? Is this the, the most effective way of communicating about Europe? I don't think so. Uh, I would prefer to have my national politicians uh, being uh, you know, coherent with themselves, if they believe in Europe, if they support Europe, they should defend Europe in the national debate. Sometimes it doesn't happen, to be frank. And I think this is part of the problem. The, the other element is that we are a complex structure. We are a strange animal. I saw that in Washington, trying to, you know, I traveled around the, the US, as I told you, and sometimes they look at me and say, who is this guy? I mean, what is this thing, European Union? Are you a country? Uh, I had these questions for many Americans, I can tell you. Are you a country? Well, what are you? What, what is this? Uh, we are a complex animal. Even to our own citizens, it's, a, it's strange that, you know, but I vote for my prime minister, and then there's someone in Brussels telling my prime minister what he should do. What, well, what is this? This is not democratic. So our democratic system is a complex one. Of course it is democratic. The decisions are taken ultimately by the Council of Ministers or the European Council, where the national governments are represented, having been elected by the people, and the European Parliament, which is actually elected directly by the people, by all of us. Uh, for under and something million people. These are the two institutions that take decisions. The Commission, which is made of politicians and, and bureaucrats, it's an administration, has a, a certain number of powers, but basically it has the power to initiate and to implement. But in the middle you have a decision that is taken democratically. So it took me about three minutes to explain something that I'm not sure you understood fully, but certainly normal citizens without your level of information and education would find even more difficult to understand, <laughs> right? So how can I translate this in very simple terms uh, uh, and be capable of, of countering uh, the populist's way of speaking, which is basically, uh, you know, simple solutions for complex problems, uh, the simplistic language of populism is very difficult to counter. So these are some of the difficulties that we have in, in sort of communicating Europe. Uh, and my point remains that I would like to see bigger efforts from the national level uh, to, to promote the idea of Europe and to explain the idea of Europe. And the last point on this, I think the more we involve citizens, the more we stimulate the participation of citizens in, in European affairs, uh, the better. And uh, some efforts have been developed, and I'm sure we can do more. I'm sure all of you in your future professional lives will be part of, of that effort, those who are committed to the European project. Your second question is a, a very large one and complex one. It has to do with enlargement or extension of the European Union. So the fact first, we started with six, we are now 27. This is a major expansion, <laughs> you agree with me. We started with a few countries in Western Europe, uh, and we are now, uh, you know, you, you, you start in Lisbon, you finish in, in the Russian border, and you are still in the European Union, right? You go to Northern Ireland, not Northern Ireland anymore, I'm saying, well. Uh, you go to the north of Ireland, 
uh, and you go all the way to Cyprus and you're still in the European Union. And this is, as such, a great achievement. We brought in countries like mine, Portugal, was uh, living in a dictatorship like Spain or Greece. And then we brought in all the countries behind the Iron Curtain. And these are all European countries. And uh, how can I, you know, Portuguese citizen, having gone through the experience I briefly described in the beginning, having Europe as the source of hope for my country and for my generation, deny the same dream to other Europeans in other parts of the continent of Europe. I cannot do that, I should not do that. So when the conditions were met for the countries from the ex-Soviet uh, Union and others to join, that was the right thing to do. And uh, I still believe it was the right thing to do. Of course, it created unbalances, it uh, destabilized the system, of course. We need to adapt. You know, for those who have children, where, when we have another children, it, it you know, complicates life, uh, it costs more, uh, but it brings enormous joy. And it allows the other children to, and Federico has three, so he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, it creates a different relationship within the family. It normally improves the quality of relationship within a family, but it raises a few challenges. And this is what enlargement did as well. Uh, it created more imbalances, more diversity, more differences in terms of economic development and otherwise. Even some political differences, one must recognize that. Different degrees of maturity in, 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 in different systems, including the democratic system. These are challenges when you enlarge. But the benefit of it is first that you recognize the right of others to benefit from what you've benefited already. You don't close the club. And secondly, it gives you, everybody, a different scale. And in international relations, size matters. On trade, on foreign direct investment, on strategic issues, I can guarantee you, and I was witness of that, that countries like China looked in a, at a, very, in a very different way to Europe after the 2004 enlargement. Why? Size, scale, the amount of space we occupy in the world atlas. And this is very important for each of the countries, not only those who joined, that joined, but also those who are already there, who will benefit from an enlarged market, an enlarged sort of world relative weight. All that is fine. But, but of course, your question is about the Balkans, and I, I fully understood it. So in this process of enlargement, we had to uh, we had to be sure that we had criteria, that decisions were taken according to established uh, practice and rules and uh, param param parameters. Uh, and this has been developed gradually throughout time. So each country that wants to join needs to uh, fulfill a number of criteria, a number of, you know, you know how it is before we start negotiations, and then during negotiations, they have to gradually implement a number of, of uh, measures and decisions in order to, at, at one point in time, be ready to, to join the European Union. There is another element that we introduced some years ago, is this idea of the capacity to absorb. Uh, you know, the, the countries that are already in need to be very careful about uh, the guaranteeing that the conditions are met for the new countries to come without uh, excessively destabilizing the building. So all these elements are taken in consideration. We've taken recently new steps to accelerate the, the future integration of Balkan countries. 
you know, a number of them are already in, inside the Union, as, as you know, and some are more advanced than others in preparation. So this is a dynamic process between their reforms and our capacity to accommodate them. But we are on track, the process is ongoing, and I hope, personally, that in the not too distant future, more Balkan countries can join the European Union. But the conditions need to be met on both sides. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for as it's now after six. Before we thank the ambassador, I just want to remind you, um, please not to leave your seats until you're asked to do so by a member of committee. We'll be leaving by the back door um, and it should only take a couple of minutes, but please don't leave your seats until you're asked to do so. With that, please join me in thanking Ambassador Valle Almeida. Thank you.